Between the years 2019 and 2022, there were 73 million children in the United States. Of those 73 million, 25% or 18,250,000 were being exposed to alcohol abuse or dependency in the family. 11 million children under the age of 18 were living with at least one alcoholic parent. Some of your friends, loved ones, and even people who work alongside you in the office are keeping a deep, dark secret from you that they were told not to talk about at a very young age. They may look calm and collected on the outside, but on the inside, they struggle with ghosts and demons from their past. You may detect sadness in the eyes and behind the smile of a friend, but you're not sure why. It's possible that these people were raised in a dysfunctional family where one or both of their parents were alcoholics. It's really painful for me to sit and watch my parents' wedding film. For me, it's like watching a horror movie that I've seen a thousand times before. Lurking up ahead is a monster who is about to leap from the shadows and attack both of them. Sometimes, hoping I can save them from their impending doom, I want to scream out to warn them of the danger that lies ahead so the movie has a different ending this time. I think that maybe they'll hear me and decide to call the wedding off and go their separate ways. Sometimes I think if I could just go back in time and stop them from getting married, maybe they'd each find a different partner to marry and live happily ever after. Unfortunately, there was no happily ever after for either of them. Both of their lives ended tragically, and there's not a thing I can do about it today. This is the house where my earliest memories of life begin. It's also where my parents' marriage and our family began to fall apart. It was a sunny day in the summer of 1970 when the Cuyahoga County Sheriff showed up at our door to evict us from our home. I was only four years old at the time, and my sister made it seem like she, myself, mom, dad, and my brother were all just camping in my dad's white 1965 Ford Galaxy. It didn't occur to me that we were homeless until many years later. But how did we get here? How does a family end up living in the street? To answer that question, I've got to take you back in time. But before I do that, I've got to answer two very important questions for each and every one of you. Who am I? And why should you care? Honestly, I'm no one at all. I don't have a fancy degree from an Ivy League school. I don't have a number one song in the Billboard charts. I've never been on Oprah or Dr. Phil. My claim to fame? I'm one of 8 million Americans who was raised by one or both parents who were alcoholics. Hi, my name is Pete. And this is my story of being raised by two alcoholic parents. I'm 56 years old and I'm the youngest of four, but I really consider myself to be an only child. That's because by the time I was nine, all three of my older siblings had moved out of the house and gone on to other things. I wanted to make this film because I've grown tired 
of the stigma that people like myself who are raised in dysfunctional families carry with us, the baggage we carry with us that we're not allowed to talk about. You're either told at a very young age not to talk about your parents' addiction, or it's understood you don't talk about it. My dad's addiction to alcohol was so severe that it was very similar to him being a heroin addict. And there was nothing that would stand between him and his next drink. Despite everything, I was a good kid growing up. I had friends and I never got into trouble. The effects of what I experienced at home didn't start to emerge in my personality until I started dating when I was a teenager in high school. If a girl showed me the slightest bit of attention, I'd fall madly in love. If someone broke up with me, I'd be devastated. In college, things got even worse, especially when it came to dating. Women I should have never gone out with I pursued. As I look back on it now, I was needy, paranoid, had fear of abandonment and trust issues, and suffered from depression. These are just some of the many residual side effects from being raised in an alcoholic home. The alcoholic's disease permeates the entire family. No one escapes without being damaged in some way, shape, or form. When World War II came to an end, Dad was 21 years old when he was honorably discharged from the United States Army Air Corps, where he had served as a waste gunner in a B-17. After the war, he moved back to his hometown of Cambridge, Ohio, and lived with his parents before attending Ohio University in the fall of 1946. Mom was 17 years old and a junior at Cleveland Heights High School. She lived with her parents, her sister Mary, and their dog Nuisance. She also had plans to attend Ohio University in the fall of 1946. My parents' paths crossed for the first time on one fateful day in 1947 on the front steps of Cutler Hall located on the main campus of Ohio University. I got in my car in one sunny, sunny morning and drove to Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. That's where my mom and dad met in the late 1940s. It's where I went to college. Both of my brothers and my sister went there. Most of their kids got their degrees there. And I even had an uncle that attended in the late 1940s. So there's a lot of good memories for me at Ohio University. But, there's a lot of ghosts that walk that campus, too. Tired singing you a love song To see how I feel for you Tried me a lullaby The light of the silvery moon There's a lot of ghosts on this entire campus. There's a lot of ghosts in this hotel. A lot of memories. This hotel is where my family always stayed when we came to high university to visit my siblings. Both my brothers, my older, two older brothers and my older sister went to school here and we would always drive down here and stay in this hotel. But here I am, I'm in Athens, Ohio. I'm at the Ohio University Inn. It's a beautiful sunny day. There's lots, lots of memories here. Lots of ghosts. Lots of ghosts. Will somebody help me? Help me through the night. Well, I'm singing love songs about you. Just don't see the light. But this is a high university. This is where it all started. 
Cutler Hall behind me is where my parents met. They met on the steps of Cutler Hall back in the 1940s. Back then, this was the office for the College of Fine Arts. And uh, my mom was a fine arts major. My dad was a journalism major. And I'm guessing that mom was coming out of here meeting with an academic advisor, perhaps even uh, having an art class. And uh, I guess they bumped into each other. I wonder what cheesy line my dad used to get her to uh, talk to him, you know. Pardon me, did it hurt when you fell from heaven? <laughs> hey, can I have your phone number? Because I've lost mine. I wonder what he said. I'd love to know what he said to her, you know. But that's where it all began. That's where their life came together. That's where fate took, took over. And they became, they became a thing, an item. Mom and Dad got married on September 10th, 1949. Afterwards, they lived off campus so Dad could finish school. He graduated in June of 1950 with a degree in journalism. After graduation, they moved to my mother's hometown of Cleveland Heights, Ohio. Dad got a job selling advertising for the Cleveland Press. Once they were established, they bought a house and started a family. My three older siblings were born between 1950 and 1957. Then, after more than eight years since the birth of their last child, on October 23, 1965, at 4.33 in the morning, I was born. Behind the eight ball from the very start, weighing in at only four pounds, nine and a half ounces, there I was, a preemie, born into what I now refer to as Hurricane Nancy and Harry. I spent the first several weeks of my life in an incubator until I gained enough weight to be sent home. Mom said the day I was born, Dad was home drunk out of his mind. I'm not sure how I got home once they finally decided to release me. The doctor probably put me in the taxi and sent me on my way. From 1950 until 1968, Dad sold advertising for the Cleveland Press, one of two local newspapers in Cleveland. Just like on the hit TV show Mad Men, he smoked Lucky Strikes and kept a bottle of whiskey at his desk, as did all the men who worked alongside him. Rubbing elbows with clients over a three martini lunch at local cocktail lounges and burlesque clubs was the norm. Mom said dad was very well liked by his clients and his boss. She told me his boss actually cried the day he had to fire him. From that day forward, his drinking escalated and his life went spiraling out of control and he took all of us right along with him. I guess my dad had been known to skip a day or two of work or skip client meetings to go sit in the park and drink, drink booze. I don't know what the official story is. All I know is it was 1968. My dad had four kids at home and a wife and a mortgage, and he was out of a job. My dad got a job in advertising at a smaller newspaper in a separate county, and he lost that job by like 1970. We had moved into this big house, this big, Colonial house built probably in the early 1920s. It was dark and shadowy inside. I remember it as being very dusty and drafty. When we lived in this house, we didn't have any food. I didn't know why. I was three years old in 1968. By 1970, 1969, 1970, I was four, almost five. And I just remember my mom would feed me buttered crackers for lunch. That's all we had for lunch. 
and as you know, we'd we'd go out into the living room and we'd sit on this old tattered Oriental rug. It was this maroon and gold tad tattered maroon and gold Oriental rug. And it was filthy. It was just dirty and dusty. And we'd sit on it and she'd bring out a plate of saltine crackers with butter and jelly on them. And that was my lunch. That's all we had. I very, very much remember that. I remember how hungry I was all the time. I remember going to bed in this house. Being so hungry, I would dream about food. I remember one time I dreamed, and I still remember this dream. I was four years old, three or four years old. And I remember that I was in the dark. It was completely dark in this dream. And all of a sudden, at about this height in the dream, this hamburger just appeared. This big, juicy hamburger with a bun and lettuce and tomato and ketchup and everything. And I was so hungry. And I reached out to grab it, to eat it. I was like, oh, I'm going to eat. And, and, and the hamburger disappeared. It just faded away. And I woke up crying. When we got evicted, basically all hell broke loose. Movers and the sheriff knocked on the door. And, you know, they just started taking our stuff. That's all I remember. I remember these really huge black guys in green overalls coming into the house and grabbing, the, you know, grabbing all of our furniture, the dining room table and, and, and our chairs and furniture and beds. And I guess they were going to put it into storage. I don't remember much about that day other than my whole family, me, my dad, my mom, my brother, my sister, and myself all standing in the front yard kind of congregating. I remember my mom and my sister running into the house to grab whatever they could to take with us and putting it in the trunk of my dad's car. It was kind of funny. We somehow grabbed our black and white TV set. We didn't let the movers take the TV set. We just piled into my dad's car. It was me, my dad, my mom, my brother closest to me in age and myself and my sister in this car. And, you know, we were homeless and we didn't know where to go. And we had some neighbors down the street that were nice enough to take us in. They um, offered to have us come into their house. I don't know if they offered or my dad talked his way into it. I th I'm pretty sure my dad, the bullshit artist that he was, he talked his way into their house. They agreed to let us come in and stay until they discovered mom and dad had broken into their liquor cabinet and drank all their booze. <laughs> had drank all their booze and um, stolen some money from them. Then we were kicked out almost immediately. I don't think we were there more than a couple of hours. The next thing I remember after that, all of a sudden we were on this dirt road in another county over. We were way out in the country, talking about fields around and maple trees. And it was a bright, sunny summer day. And we're on this bouncy dirt road and it was filled with potholes. and. My dad's rickety car was shaking and rattling and I was crying. And all of a sudden we pulled into this guy's driveway. And it was a nice ranch style home on a couple acres of land. And I remember it had a pond, a small pond behind it. And this, this was back in the days when people in the country kept their doors unlocked in their houses. And it just so happened that the guy that owned the house was a fraternity brother of my father's from college. And when we pulled into his driveway, the man and his wife and his son just happened to be on vacation. And uh, my dad just walked into the house. And we basically set up shop in this man's family room at the front of his house. We were all living in his family room, kind of like Eddie, I guess, in uh, Christmas vacation. You know, there, there's me, my brother, my sister, my mom, my dad, all living on this guy's couch, watching his color TV. I remember the man came home from vacation with his family and all hell broke loose. And I think my dad talked him into letting us stay, I think. And from what I'm told, um, we were only there a couple of weeks. The man that owned the house, his name is Mr. Mayo. And Mr. Mayo was the president of a local bank. 
and his bank owned this old farmhouse and it was on a, like 10 acres of land and it was just a old dilapidated house it was like your typical red farmhouse it was a salt box style house farmhouse and at one time it was a boarding house on a farm an old dairy farm that had been there in the late 1890s and in the early early to mid 1900s like up through like 1950 it was a farm and nobody had lived in this house for like 30 years or something this is 1970 so i don't think anybody had lived in this house since like 1945 or something like maybe 25 years but anybody had lived in it and it was old and dilapidated the, the red paint had faded the, the roof needed repairs there were broken windows missing screens there was no furnace in the house there was no electricity no running water and mr mail worked it out that he would let us stay in this house made some arrangements with the bank and got the house fixed up for us. I remember this whole crew of guys coming and painting the house and patching up the roof and getting the water turned on and the city got the water and the electricity turned on. But we didn't have a furnace. We had no heat and um, we didn't have any furniture. All of our furniture was in storage. Uh, after we were evicted, the sheriff had it all impounded or put into a storage facility somewhere in Cleveland. And uh, we lived in this farmhouse. The first night we moved in there, I remember we, we didn't have any furniture, so we all, we all slept on the floor in the living room. My sister tried to make it seem like we were camping. She laid down a blanket on the floor and folded it over so it was a little padded and made a pillow out of like a stuffed a pillowcase filled with blankets or towels. And she slept next to me on the floor. And of course, we had our black and white TV set, so <laughs> we, we got to watch TV. That's always important uh, when you've got TV and when you're homeless. I, I still think that's funny. We grabbed the TV. We lived there from the summer of 1970 until the summer of 1971. And then my dad got a job. He finally got a job working in advertising. He worked for, in advertising sales for a very small paper called the Geauga Times Leader. And it was a very small paper. We moved to the town of Chardon in the following summer. We moved into an old colonial style home built in the early 1900s. This house was just dark and cold and drafty. So this is where some of the worst things happened in this house. You know, I don't remember much about the farmhouse, but I remember a lot of bad things happening in this, this house. We, we destroyed this house. We, we had two dogs, we had a beagle and a border collie mix, and we didn't house train these dogs. Nobody even bothered to house train the dogs. They never walked them. They just let them shit and piss all over the house. And this new house in Chardon, had these beautiful, you know, varnished hardwood floors. And we just let the dogs piss all over the first floor, just everywhere. I mean, they, the, the ironic thing or the bizarre thing is they put newspapers down <laughs> to get the dogs to, to piss and shit on the newspapers. But they, they wouldn't walk them. Nobody, nobody had the, I guess, the motivation to, to house train these dogs. This is where my dad began becoming physically abusive to my mother. I don't remember him hitting her prior to this. Mom and dad got into a fight in our kitchen. And, and this house was built in the early 1900s and had those really hard plaster walls with the, the wood slat reinforcements in it. And, I, and the story goes is that my mom picked up a knife and raised it over her head and tried, tried to bring it down on my dad. And, and the point of it just got into his forehead and, and he pushed her out of the way or smacked her out of the way and she almost went right through a wall. They came home from school that day and there was this huge hole like the, like, like the impression. It was about this long and about this wide where my mother's body had gone backwards into the wall and, and it had really screwed up her back. What they did to, to cover up this hole in the, in the house was they just took a, a, a page from a, a newspaper and pinned it over the hole <laughs> to cover it up. And I remember when we moved out of the house, we, you know, we we're all hoping that the landlord wouldn't notice that we had knocked a hole in the wall.
I was seven years old when we moved into the Downey Manor apartments in the summer of 1972. We lived there until I finished second grade in June of 74. The weekends were the worst when we lived in these apartments. It always seemed to rain on the weekends. The preceding winds of the rainstorms coming off of Lake Erie would create an updraft, turning the leaves of the silver maple trees outside my bedroom window upside down so you could see their shiny underbelly. When the storms blew in, I'd be filled with dread knowing that I'd be locked inside the tiny apartment with my parents. They always got smashed on the weekends and they'd have these knockdown, drag out brawls. It was a nightmare. One evening, just before sunset, a massive storm with thunder and lightning seemed to hover over our apartment building. The fight started in the living room. I was hiding in my bedroom. I heard glass breaking, my mom screaming, my dad yelling. The fight went down the hall, past my bedroom door and terminated in their bedroom. I was so small and they were so large, it was like giants fighting in the hall. I sat in my bed with my hands over my ears, sobbing, hoping they would just stop. Then I heard our apartment door slam shut and there was silence. As I slowly opened my bedroom door, I looked up and down the hall. It was a horrific scene. The carnage stretched from the living room down the hall to their bedroom. Our two ceramic living room lamps were shattered on the living room floor. The bookcase outside my bedroom door in the hallway had been tipped over, leaving books strewn across the floor. Their bedroom door was open. I crept out of my room and into theirs. Dad was nowhere to be found. Mom was sitting on the edge of their bed crying, her face and arms black and blue. Their dresser had been tipped over and the light next to their bed smashed. Mom hugged me and cried. She apologized. To this day, every time the preceding winds of a rainstorm coming in off the lake blow the silver maple leaves upside down, I'm transported back to that apartment with giants fighting in the hall. I just can't get over how beautiful this town still is after all these years. I haven't lived here in 25 years. I just really miss this town a lot. There's a lot of good memories in this town. There's a lot of bad memories too. I mean, this is... This is where things were their worst, and this is where things were the best, where things got better. But this is also the town where my mom turned her life around. This is where my mom and dad got divorced, and my mom got a job, and she bought a house, and she, she held true to her promise. She was going to, she promised me if things didn't get better, she'd divorce dad buy a house for the two of us and get me a dog and she did both and I'm grateful to her for that Well, I first discovered the Beatles when I was eight years old. It was February of 1974, and the TV show 60 Minutes was doing a segment on the 10th anniversary of the Beatles coming to America. When this special came on, and on came this segment about the Beatles, and I was riveted. I was just blown away. It was maybe a 10 minute segment they held at the end of the show, and I remember when it was over, I was so immediately obsessed with the Beatles, I jumped up and ran down the hallway to the bedroom, my bedroom that I shared with my older brother. And I remember he had a whole, like a grapefruit crate of records. But I remember seeing this band, the Beatles, in this grapefruit crate. 
buried in amongst other records. I mean, we had, you know, Miles Davis and Wes Montgomery and Dave Brubeck and all kinds of jazz and big band records. And I, I'm right, I rifled through the records and I found the Beatles records. And there was the Beatles 65 and there was uh, the Beatles second album and Meet the Beatles and Abbey Road. And I just started playing these records over and over again. They were fascinating. Their music just struck a chord with me. Their look struck a chord with me. You know, I'm only eight years old. It's 1974 and I look back on it in retrospect and I think about the situation. You know, our family was a mess back then. Uh, my dad was deeply addicted to alcohol by this time. We were living in poverty. My parents were fighting constantly. I mean, we're not just talking screaming matches, we're talking them beating the hell out of each other, throwing furniture each, at each other, my mother getting beat up, all black and blue. And uh, I think the Beatles were a sanctuary for me. I think they, their music provided a place for me to go and hide. And I, I would get lost in the Beatles music and I would forget about everything that was going on all around me. I forgot all about the alcoholism and the fighting and the loneliness. I think the Beatles gave me sanctuary by giving me a place to go, by giving me a place to run and hide. I think the Beatles really gave me something that I couldn't find at home. By the time I was eight, my older brother got married and moved out of the house. He had, he, had, he had actually went to college in 1968 and hadn't really come back. My sister got married in 1973 and she was living about five hours away with her husband. And they were both going to college at the time. So it was just me, my mom, my dad, and my brother closest to me in age living at home. And my brother closest in age at the time had gotten a job in a restaurant and he had learned to drive, so he was never home. And so he was gone. I was home alone with, with my mom and dad most of the time. And I think the Beatles became like surrogate parents to me. They became surrogate parents. They became surrogate brother and sister. M more surrogate brothers than a sister because my sister, even though she was away, she tried to do her best in keeping in touch with, with, with me and mom and to see if I was okay, and she, she would call all the time and write, and she would uh, visit on the weekends sometimes from school with her husband. And she was the one, the one person um, that actually seemed to care about me and mom. She, she really did her best. But the Beatles became like a surrogate to me. They became a surrogate brother, a surrogate father. And by the time I was nine, my brother closest to me in age had gone to college. So I was home alone with mom and dad. And I had nothing, you know, I, you know, I had some friends that I would hang out with, but the Beatles music just, it saved me, it lifted me up. It, it took me to a new place, you know, it, it made me happy. It, it brought me happiness and love and joy. All those feelings that I didn't have at home. I don't know if I could have made it without the Beatles. The Beatles really, really got me through a lot. They took away the loneliness. After discovering the music of the Beatles, I slipped into a fantasy world to escape what was going on at home. I'm not sure how else to describe it other than to say I was living in a dream world. It was like I was high on their music all the time. When I was in third grade, I drove my parents crazy, insisting that they take me to the mall to find Beatle boots. Keep in mind that the Beatles hadn't been a group in five years, and they hadn't sold Beatle boots in over ten. I lived in this Beatle-induced fantasy world until I was in my mid-thirties. Positive side of all this, they inspired me to become a musician and write over 150 songs and record five CDs of original music. Both of my parents grew up in an era where everybody drank. It was a cultural thing where, you know, everybody had cocktail parties and would have a couple martinis after work and things like that. My mother's drinking was pretty severe. 
but it was mostly in the evenings and on the weekends. Mostly on the weekends from how I remember it. Mom always pulled it together so she made sure I was up in the morning, had my breakfast and I was off to school. Her drinking escalated when his drinking escalated. And I remember her saying something really weird. She said, well, if you can't beat them, join them. Which meant, you know, she couldn't get him to stop drinking, so she may as well just join him. And she would, she'd throw him back and get just as drunk as he was. My mom went into rehab in 73, and she said that was it. She was done with it. She was not gonna do rehab again, and she wasn't, she was, she was going to AA meetings with my dad. But I don't think she bought into what she referred to as their mumbo jumbo. By 1975, my mom got sober. She just decided that was enough. In spring of 1976, it was Mother's Day week. I came down with chicken pox. I was 10 years old. And one night, all I remember is I started projectile vomiting. And I was vomiting so much that just brown, this brown liquid was coming out of me. I was in a coma for about a week. And the next thing I know, I woke up in a hospital bed. And I looked around and all I saw were like 10 or 15 people wearing white gowns and surgical masks and surgical caps and I could only see their eyes. And I didn't recognize anyone except for my dad. I saw my dad and I said, hi dad. You know, just like that. <laughs> and I just remember everybody letting out the sigh of relief that I was alive. My chicken pox had progressed to something called Rye syndrome, which is a viral infection. And Rye syndrome causes the brain to swell. And as the brain swells, it has nowhere to go and it begins to recede into the spinal column. the central nervous system begins to shut down all the vital functions of the body, the lungs and the heart and the kidneys and the liver and all that stuff start to shut down. 85% of the kids that got this died. And I, for some reason, survived it. But from that day forward, my mom promised me, she promised me that she would give me a better life. She promised me that if dad didn't sober up, she would divorce him and she'd find a way to get us a house, buy a house of our own and get me a dog. And she kept her word. And by 1977, near the end of 1977, my dad had gone into one of the best treatment centers in the country it was in Aliquippa, Pennsylvania. And they told us that the recovery rate of most addicts that came out of this treatment center was like 80%. And so we had these great hopes that he would come out of there and he'd feel good and he'd be sober again. Well, dad was gone for about, I don't know what it was. It was a long time. I think it might've been three months. And the day he came home, I'll never forget this. This van pulled in our driveway, and he got out of the van with his sponsor. His sponsor's name was Dick. And my dad got out where he wore this. He always wore this long, like, trench coat that most men wore back then, like a tan, button-down, full-length trench coat, raincoat type thing. And he looked brand new. He looked young. He looked, his eyes were clear. His skin was clear. He looked so good, I'd never seen him look that good before. And he walked in the house and we, we hugged him and, you know, we said hi and I said, I love you. I'm so glad that you're back. Within a matter of an hour or so, 
after he got reacclimated in the house. He said, well, I'm going to go out and get some bread and some milk. And mom and I looked at each other, you know, we just like looked at each other and said, okay. He left, he got in his car and he left. And he went down to the local convenience store. Came home and he had been drinking. So my father had been out of rehab no more than an hour or two and he was already drunk. And mom, I don't remember how soon it happened, but mom basically ended, ended the marriage right there. It was 1982 and I worked at a small local grocery store called Hometown Foods right here in this plaza. My friend Paul and I were gathering carts right out here and I had just come back with a group of carts and there was this guy walking towards me down this way, an older gentleman. I kind of ignored him at first. I saw that he was staggering and I looked up and I noticed it was my father. His eyes were dark and sunken in his head. He was really skinny and gaunt looking. He looked horrible. I almost didn't recognize him, he looked so bad. And he kind of staggered down here and he walked off this way towards the McDonald's. And that was the last time I ever saw him. And as I saw him, I got, I was horrified. I just, I just ran back inside the door to the, the door to the grocery store it was right here and I ran back inside and my friend was like, what are you doing? Why did you run inside? And I said, well, you wouldn't understand. He's like, what? what, why did you run inside? And I said, well, my dad was out there. And he's like, so? And I said, you, you don't understand. I never told him until years later why I ran inside that day. But I was horrified at seeing my dad. I didn't want anybody to know that that was my dad. I was very embarrassed and it's, it's hard when, you're, when your father's the town drunk and he's staggering around town, bumming money off of people. And I think that's what he was probably doing. And I hadn't seen him for a couple of years up to that point. I hadn't seen him in a long time. Boy, I got my first guitar a long, long time ago. <laughs> it was a long time ago. Um, my mom and dad got divorced in 1977. And I was in seventh grade. And my mom took a job with a factory. She worked in a factory where she soldered PC boards together all day long. She bought a house. Uh, we bought a small house, a 900 square foot house off the square in Chardon. And it had a nice, nice size yard, about a quarter of an acre. She got me a dog and I named the dog Coco. And Coco was a brown Labrador Springer Spaniel mix. And after mom had worked at this factory for a while, she saved up some money and I had been bugging her to get me a guitar. She went out and bought me my first guitar. It was a six string acoustic guitar. It's, this is it right here. And we'll, uh, we'll open this up. This is the original case, <laughs> cardboard case. It's not strung anymore. And this is my Hondo 2 six string acoustic guitar. And it's made in Korea. And this is my first guitar. And I played this guitar to death. And she got it for me for our first Christmas together after mom and dad got divorced. And I can't tell you how thrilled I was. I was just beside myself with happiness. She agreed to sign me up for guitar lessons. There was a small guitar music store in town on the square in Chardon called Zamer's Music. First things I learned on her were like Jingle Bells and, uh, you know, things like that. But the first song I learned all the way through, I learned to read music. And the first song I learned to read music on was Let It Snow. But I learned everything on this guitar. I learned the first song, the first Beatles song I ever learned and the first song ever that I learned, pop song was yesterday. Then I learned the song Help, because Help at the time 
was my most favorite song. You know, music has been a source of inspiration. Music has been my counselor. Music has been a sanctuary. Music has been a way of me going down the road of self-discovery and learning about myself. And if it weren't for the guitar and the guitar my mother got, I wouldn't have had any way to really discover a lot of things I discovered about myself and about my parents and about my life. But most important, it's been a way for me to ex you know, express myself. And when they got divorced, my immediate thought at the time as an ignorant young man, is I thought once dad's gone, everything's going to get better. You know, I thought that was it. I thought my, my dad being gone, our lives will get better. Subconsciously, as I look back on it now, I went into kind of a depressive state. I was really confused because my parents are divorced. And as I look back on it, I wonder if I felt bad for my dad in a way I didn't really understand at the time. Because once he was gone, I just became very withdrawn. Once they got divorced, I became withdrawn. And I found myself retreating. And I became very reclusive. And eighth grade was probably the last time in school that I actually had friends. You know, I had really close friends until about 10th grade. Between the end of eighth grade and 10th grade, I didn't have any friends. I just would come home and play my guitar, listen to music after school. And then in 10th grade, I, I started hanging out with some new people. But I became very bitter. I became very negative. I became very um, cynical. Um, I was mad at the world, as a lot of teenagers are. And I became very, not re I guess, rebellious. I grew my hair long. I didn't start drinking and smoking. I've never smoked. I didn't have my first beer till I was 19 and, and I was in college. And I didn't drink to rebel. I drank because it was fun. It was fun. It made me feel good. It made me laugh. I used the guitar to kind of, I guess, escape. I, you know, originally I escaped in the music of the Beatles. That was my original escape. And then, then I escaped into the music of the guitar, learning to play the guitar. Towards the end of my sophomore year, my mother got sick. I got a call one day. She was in the hospital. And they uh -huh. said she was gravely ill. I sure. better get home quickly or I may never see her again. And how did that make you feel? Well, it was awful. It was horrible. And what's, okay. what's even worse is just a few months later, oh, my wow. father died. I mean... Oh, wow. Well, hey, I'm really sorry, Pete. Uh, you know what? We're out of time for today. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm really sorry. Yeah, really? yeah I'm serious. Why don't you go ahead and make an appointment for next Thursday with Rhonda at the All front right. desk? All right, I'll we see you next week. Where we left right, off thanks. today, next Thursday, okay? Yeah, I'm sorry. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Take care. Alcohol is a song that I wrote that talks about, it initially talks about how they told me that my dad had a disease, that alcoholism was a disease. You know, I'm seven, eight years old when I heard this. I'm like, what? A disease? Like cancer? I remember asking one of the counselors, like, oh, yes, it's just like cancers. Young man, and uh, your dad's a very sick man. And I found it very confusing as a kid that alcoholism my dad's issues were a disease so the opening lines they told me was sick you had a disease I found it so hard and easy to believe when the lights are out I don't know what to think at all when the lights are out you know the apartment would go dark and the, the storms would roll in off the lake and they would start fighting 
you know, and he'd beat the hell out of my mom. She'd beat the hell out of him too. And it was like two giants fighting and throwing furniture at each other. And she's going after him with knives and, you know, all kinds of horrible stuff. You know, it's just a song, it's the first song I ever really wrote to help me express myself about the confusion of being a little kid growing up in an alcoholic family, growing up with two alcoholic parents. When you're raised in this environment, it's understood, or it's told you straight out, you do not talk about this outside the house. This is something you're supposed to keep a secret. Most of the time, you don't want to talk about it. You hope nobody ever knows about it. You don't want the secret or the skeleton to get out of the closet. And I can assure you that it's a hard thing to talk about. And talking about it does help. Ta talking about it really does help. And it helps you cope with your past. I believe I'm a survivor, and I'm stronger for what I went through as a kid. I had a counselor once that told me that he had patients that he had counseled that had been through half as much as what I had gone through as a kid, and many of these people turned out to be felons, rapists, murderers. They're in the state penitentiary for doing atrocious crimes, and a lot of it stemmed from what they went through as a kid. And I feel very fortunate that I've turned out as good as I have. My dad never harmed me physically in any way, shape, or form. I remember one time I did something stupid and mom got really mad. She looked at my dad and said, well, I'm not going to spank him, you spank him. Dad took me by the hand, led me into my bedroom. He sat on the edge of my bed, turned me around, gave me a light tap on the butt and said, get out of here. To me, Dad seemed withdrawn, almost like a phantom sitting in the room with the rest of us. He never had much to say about anything that I can remember. Most of what I know about my dad, I learned from my mom. She told me he was a tremendous athlete in high school. He played baseball, football, basketball, and ran track. His popularity in school led the student body to nickname him Hercules. You can't talk about my dad without talking about baseball. Mom said he was a natural when it came to playing the game. He played first base, could bat from either side of the plate, and could throw with both hands. He and I never bonded by going to any Cleveland Indians or Cleveland Browns games together. The only time I bonded with him was when I was 13 and I wanted to try out for baseball as a pitcher. He spent a couple of weekends with me in the backyard showing me how to throw a curveball. I cherish that memory to this day. Anytime I watch a ball game on TV or see a group of guys playing at the local ballpark, I think of my dad. It was the early morning hours of January 13th, 1987, and I was asleep in bed. The 13th was a Tuesday, and Tuesdays and Thursdays, my junior year of college, were my busiest days. I was in class from 8 in the morning to about 4 in the afternoon. That morning while I slept, before I got up to go to school, I had a dream. And in this dream, it was like the third, third person perspective. It was like I was a cameraman looking through the lens of a camera in at myself sitting at a chair. And I was sitting in this chair and it was dark all around me. And from the darkness appeared my father and he was behind me. So I was sitting in this chair and he appeared behind me and he reached out and he touched me on the shoulder and he spoke to me and it was a very brief message I'm not going to say what he said because it's very personal and then he faded away and the dream ended and I didn't think anything of this dream you know I had pretty much forgotten about it you know my alarm went off I got up and went to school had my classes Came home that day, got home about 4.30, and as I walked up the steps to my fraternity house, 
I noticed a note on the front door that said, Pete, call home. It was just like a piece of yellow notebook paper taped to the door. One of my fraternity brothers had written down the note and it said, Pete, call home. Your mom wants you to call home. So I thought, that's kind of weird. So I walked, you know, I took the note off the door and I walked inside the house. You know, outside my bedroom door. This is back in the days before cell phones. And all we had were push-button phones. There was a push-button phone on the wall outside of my room. And I picked it up and I called home and I said, Hey, Mom, what's, you know, what's going on? This is Pete. And I don't remember her pausing or hesitating or trying to make it an easy thing to say. Or she didn't say, Are you sitting down? She didn't say, um, Make sure you're sitting down or are you okay right now because i got some bad news for us. She just said, I, I'm so sorry to tell you, but your dad's been murdered. And I, I re all I remember from that point forward, I heard the, the words, your dad's been murdered. And it was as if someone had punched me as hard as they could in the stomach. And I doubled over crying and I fell to the ground. Like a heap, just in a heap, I fell to the floor with the phone in my hands and I was sobbing like I had never cried before. And uh, I just remember her saying, you know, that a woman that he lived with, um, his girlfriend had shot him and then she took her own life. And I, I don't remember anything other than the phone conversation just being completely floored, completely, literally floored, like knocked to the ground by this message. And I immediately thought of the dream I had had that night, the previous night, of my dad. And it occurred to me that he had spoken to me in this dream. I didn't think it was a coincidence. I think my father was reaching out to me from the beyond to say goodbye. That dream has always stuck with me. It's always been in the back of my mind that my father, from the afterlife, he reached out to me. And I, and I think he was saying goodbye. I think he was saying he was sorry. In his own way, he was saying he was sorry for what had happened in my childhood with him. I have this feeling he wanted to speak to me before he died, but he didn't get a chance to. Soon after my father died, I began to ask the universe a lot of questions. In the spring of my senior year in college, I had what most people call a religious experience. I had found Christ. I was born again, and for the first time ever, there was serenity in my life. It was a beautiful thing, but it didn't last very long. After graduating from college, I moved back home and started hanging out with my buddies from high school. We were frequenting local bars, and Jesus pretty much went right out the window. Over the years, I've gone down a variety of different metaphysical and spiritual trails. I've tried meditation, I read a boatload of self-help books. At the advice of one counselor, I even tried exercising. But none of these things worked for me. The only thing that has helped me cope with my childhood is facing it head-on with my music and my art. I look at it like you're on the beaches of Normandy during the D-Day invasion of World War II, and you've got to get off the beach if you want to live. If you stay on the beach, you're going to get blown to pieces. I just keep forging ahead into the withering machine gun fire with my guitars, my paintbrushes, and easels. After wrestling with the ghosts and the skeletons from my past, I have come to an acceptance and have found a forgiveness towards both of my parents. My art has helped me find peace in my life today. Yeah.
thought it strange when you told me that one day your dreams would change if you were a sucker for strong silent time. Told me how after all these years, how the crossroads dropped you off and left you here. How once you leave, you can never go back. Now I've walked a thousand miles in your shoes. My clothes are torn and tattered, my eagle bruised, and I think I understand you now. Yes, I understand you now. My song, I Understand You Now, was inspired by a review of my and my parents' lives. For years, I harbored anger and resentment towards both of my parents for my crazy childhood. I wondered how they could let things get so bad. I wondered what kind of man I could have turned out to be if I had only had a normal childhood. It was many years ago when I had a life-changing epiphany. I had the day off from work and I had been drinking heavily. It was the middle of the afternoon, my wife was at work and I was at home, laying on our bed in a drunken stupor. I thought to myself, oh my god, I'm just like my dad. That thought morphed into, this must have been what it was like to be either one of my parents when they were drinking. I lay there and I reviewed their lives and my life. As I assessed the list of many bad choices I had made over the years of my own life and how disillusioned I had become, it occurred to me that one bad choice can screw everything up. When I was a kid, my parents seemed bigger than life to me. Even though they both struggled with addiction, they seemed infallible. Sometimes to me it seemed as if they were playing a role in an old black and white movie. Tears streamed from my eyes as I realized how I was struggling with my own addiction to alcohol. It was then that I realized what it was like to walk in their shoes. It was at that moment that I began to see my parents as being human. Like each of us, they were once two young, intelligent, beautiful kids with their entire lives in front of them. One wrong choice sent them both careening off the road and to the bottom of a cliff. It was at that moment I began to understand them, and I sobbed out loud, I understand you now. One day when I was shaving, I looked in the mirror and for the first time ever, I saw my dad staring back at me. It occurred to me at that moment that I can't hate either of my parents because there is a part of each of them in me. To hate them, I'd have to hate myself. It felt as if a huge weight was lifted from my shoulders because it was at that moment that I found complete forgiveness in my heart towards both of them. You can't run away from your past, so you might as well confront it. Without forgiveness, the road to recovery is near next to impossible. All three of my siblings had issues with my mom. See, my mom could be the most beautiful, kind, caring, loving, empathetic woman in the world. She had a huge heart and she had a tremendous sense of humor. But if you pissed her off or if something didn't go the way she thought it should, she would lash out at you verbally and say the most hurtful, damning, nasty things that you could think of. For instance, once when I was 12, I had a tantrum because my mom wanted me to do something and I didn't want to do it. We were in the kitchen. I had this tantrum and I kicked the broom closet door off its hinges and it flew across the kitchen and hit the wall. And my mom turned her back to me and said, oh, you're retarded and everybody knows it. And I was stunned. I was just completely floored that she would say something like this to me. And I'm like, I'm retarded. You know, I'm 12 years old. And I, I remember from that day forward, I really wondered what was wrong with me. I thought, well, maybe there really is something wrong with me. Because, you know, it's just at this age where I was, you know, discovering myself sexually. I was just discovering girls. I couldn't get girls to like me. I, and then I started thinking, well, maybe girls don't like me because I'm retarded. After all these years, I realized my mom would say things that didn't always make sense. But, you know, the way I look at it is this. If, if the definition of being retarded is someone who's published four books, five CDs of original music, written 150 songs like I have, painted paintings, and been pretty successful as a photographer as I have, then I'm a retard.
My mom was a phenomenal artist. She could paint, draw, sculpt, even do cartooning. When I was a kid, it was fascinating to watch her create. She inspired me to become an artist and is the reason why I'm an artist today. Near the end of her life, I asked her why she gave up her art and she said she was a sucker for the strong silent type. She also said, sometimes your dreams change. It breaks my heart to think of her giving up such talent for my dad and her four kids, three of whom would have nothing to do with her near the end of her life. What a waste of talent. What a waste of a life. She had a great sense of humor and an infectious laugh. Her sense of humor got me through a lot of tough times. She gave her life to make up for the mistakes she made when I was a kid. I'll always be grateful to her for that. I just wish I realized that and could have told her when she was still living. This is a painting I did of my mother. I guess you would call it on plain air because I did it in pro it was an impromptu painting. I did one night while my mom and I were watching TV and it's the title of this piece is Thursday Night Television. And I named it that because every Thursday night my mom and I would watch TV shows like Seinfeld or Cheers, things like that. We would sit and just watch these <laughs> TV shows, Seinfeld especially, and, and we would just sit there and laugh and laugh and laugh. I realize now that I captured a moment in time, not just in our lives together at watching TV, but in her life. What I see here is a woman who went from this beautiful, petite, young thing and over the years, life had just beat her on the rocks. She had just been smashed upon the rocks. And I think here you see a woman and what I depicted unintentionally, but what I, what's depicted here is a woman who is defeated. I think she's kind of defeated and she's broken. And the expression I captured on her face is very sad. It, it, it makes me sad because I know at this time, when she's sitting here, my mother was um, dying from emphysema and lung cancer. I bet you my mom is pissed that <laughs> we buried her in the same cemetery as my father. Well. She's probably rolling in her grave saying, how dare you bury me? Well, hopefully not. You're, you're your father. But yeah, I, I like to come here every couple of years. I don't know, I don't know what purpose it serves, but it's, it's nice to at least try to keep their graves kind of cleaned up. It's a pretty cemetery. Mm -hmm. And part of my healing process was finding empathy towards my parents and forgiveness towards both of them. And even though I'm not completely out of the woods and I still have a lot of issues I deal with, I found forgiveness towards both of my parents and it's a huge, huge step towards recovery and towards happiness. And I feel for both of them. I feel deeply for them and their struggle. Their lives are miserable. And I know this because my mom said that every day that they were married, Every morning that my father woke up in bed next to her, he'd roll over onto his back, look up at the ceiling and say, oh shit. And those are not the words of a man who's happy. Those are the words of a man who's struggling with something. And I can tell you, I think my dad struggled with something. There were demons that were haunting him and chasing him. And I'm not talking about biblical demons. I think my dad struggled a good portion of his life with something and I don't know what that something was. Every now and then, mom would say to me, I wonder what your brothers and your sister are up to. She'd then say, I sure wish I knew what I did to them. 
One time after telling her I had no idea what they were up to because I hadn't spoken to them either, she said, you know, I think hell is right here on Earth. Thank you. 